Uh, so for those of you who have attended our events in the past, you know Dr. Paul Curtis. Uh, he is a professor and department extension leader in the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment at Cornell University. Um, Paul is a co-author on the National Wildlife Control Training Program and a certified wildlife biologist with the Wildlife Society. Um, and today, Paul is going to be talking to us about groundhog or woodchuck management. And at this time, uh, you can take it away, Paul. Thanks much, Matt. And welcome, everybody, uh, to the uh, lunch seminar today, where I'd like to do give you some background and hopefully useful information on managing woodchuck conflicts in and around uh, residential areas. To start with, uh, woodchucks, you're probably mostly aware, are rodents, uh, uh, fairly large to medium-sized mammals. Uh, they're in the genus Marmota. They're marmots uh, related to yellow-bellied marmot out west. But the more interesting thing, I think, they're in the family Sciuridae. And Sciuridae uh, includes all the, the tree and ground squirrels. And so the woodchuck is nothing more than a large ground squirrel. And because of that, they dig well and burrow well, and they climb very well. I've seen woodchucks up 15, 20 feet in fruit trees, stripping branches of, of fruit. So it makes it one of the more difficult vertebrate pests we have to deal with because they both dig and climb and uh, find their way around a lot of different types of exclusion devices. What do woodchucks eat? They've got an extremely varied diet. They take fruit, bark, grass, uh, flowers in your uh, flower beds, garden plants in your backyard, a variety of crops, both vegetables and fruit. And so they eat many different types of plants and crops that we find valuable and hence create all sorts of problems. The woodchuck biology, uh, uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, they breed in March and April. Litter size ranges from two to six. It's fairly typical, uh, most often for the adult female to have four young, similar to this photograph. Uh, they wean in late uh, June, early July. And as soon as the younger wean, they leave the burrow and they're off on their own. And the young uh, don't have the experience and aren't strong enough to create a new burrow system. So they're traveling the landscape looking for unoccupied burrows. Uh, so People that are doing woodchuck control, lethal control, say shooting or trapping, and they're successful removing adult animal, usually it's less than a week or two before uh, one of these young, what we call floaters in the population, finds the abandoned burrow and then uh, it's reoccupied. So it's really difficult to keep woodchucks from reoccupying unused burrows. Most of the burrows are dug by older animals uh, during uh, late summer. The ideal eviction time to remove woodchucks is uh, essentially right now, August, September, and in early October. During the winter months uh, from uh, late October, early November, and uh, late February, uh, woodchucks are in their burrows hibernating and uh, uh, control's not that valuable. You've got a, a window in March, uh, late February, March, when the animals emerge prior to breeding season in April, when it's really good to do control early in the spring. Uh, and then you've got the a couple of month window now where it's really good to do control again. The burrow systems are what usually get the woodchucks in the most trouble. Yes, they take a variety of plants, uh, but they create a fairly extensive burrow system. You've probably all seen woodchuck burrows at one time. The main entrance will have this dirt mound associated with it. The woodchucks uh, dig the burrow system and bring all the dirt out the main entrance. They always, almost always build their burrow system against some type of hard structure. In this case, it's a, a building foundation and they have all sorts of, create all sorts of problems with disrupting building and other structure. In this case, it was in an orchard and this is a burrow at the base of an apple tree. You can see how they damaged, extensively damaged the root system. Uh, they've sent Mark and uh, and chewed bark at the base of the tree. That tree's probably a goner in not too many years, uh, so they can do significant damage. And way to tell whether or not a burrow is active, is just to place a few sticks over it and watch it for 24 to 48 hours. If those sticks stay in place, it's probably an unoccupied burrow that you can try to fill in and react or deactivate best as possible. Most of the time, people rely on removal. Uh, lethal control for solving woodchuck problems in, in rural areas and farmlands that could be shooting, 
Most often folks will select a small caliber, high velocity rifle, uh, for example, a 22 caliber, 22 Magnum, 223 caliber, something that shoots flat, uh, usually a scoped rifle because woodchucks are, are, don't like to be around people. So you're usually taking longer distance shots at 75, 100 yards or more. Trapping is another very effective control technique in most urban residential areas. I recommend cage traps or box traps. Woodchucks are very easily caught in traps with a variety of different baits. Talk about that in a moment. And you can uh, do lethal control with gas cartridges. There is a registered gas cartridge product. I'll show you the uh, product and the EPA number in a moment. Trapping, I want to spend a few minutes on. By far and away, I do essentially 95% of my trapping with cage trap because I don't want to have to worry about non-target captures. In urban suburban areas, if you use body gripping traps such as this conibear, very effective putting a conibear trap at a burrow entrance and getting an animal to come in and out. The problem is not only woodchucks use those burrows, opossums, skunks, maybe your neighbor's cat might stick its head down a burrow out of curiosity, or maybe a small dog might stick its head down a burrow out of curiosity, and anything that sticks its head through one of these counter bear traps is going to be dead. And so non-targets are, uh, are something that you really got to worry about when you're woodchuck trapping. Because of that, body gripping trap laws in New York State are, are very strict. If you're using any type of a, a baited body gripping trap with jaws ranging from five and a half to seven and a half inches, those are the typical size body gripping traps that you're going to use for woodchucks, either 160 or 220 counter bear. And in using those in land sets in New York, they need to be in some type of a protected cubby with a maximum opening 10 by 10 inches to try again, try to reduce uh, non-targets that are going to stick their head through those type of traps and have uh, uh, unanticipated animal mortality. And that's actually illegal to set a uh, body gripping trap with a seven and a half inch jaw or larger, something like the Counter Bear 330 uh, on land anywhere. Those can only be used in water sets. There are a variety of commercial woodchuck baits on the market to lure animals in the traps and sets. Uh, personally, uh, I don't use those very much. I find apples, sliced apples are about as good as anything for a woodchuck bait. Sliced carrots will work. Uh, we had an orchard trial going on years ago uh, where woodchucks were damaging cherry trees and stripping cherries off of limbs. And so I just used cherries for, for bait in that trial and that worked just fine. So any type of, of fruit like that uh, that the animal's feeding on will work as well as, or maybe even better than some of the commercial baits that you can buy. I mentioned gas cartridges. The Giant Destroyer gas cartridge is registered in New York State for controlling uh, woodchucks and, and uh, ground squirrels. Uh, the EPA registration number is there. I want to caution you when using gas cartridges, these do create a fire hazard. So you shouldn't be using them under buildings, for example. If you're using them in uh, rural farmland settings uh, and it's a really dry summer, for example, in hay hay field, there's a risk for uh, getting fired. So you want to be aware of uh, conditions around where you're setting it. The way you use the destroyer is you try to find all the openings uh, to the burrow system. Uh, take a shovel, uh, cut a piece of sod, turn it upside down for each of the openings you find, except for the, the main entrance. Then uh, when you get to the main entrance, uh, uh, light, you use the cartridge. Put it into the burrow system as far as you can and then cover uh, the main entrance uh, with a piece of sod turned upside down to keep the, uh, the gas in the burrow system. These, uh, there was a study done in Connecticut years ago and it showed that uh, the efficacy for these was about you know, 95% or better at killing animals in the burrow system. The problem is with lots of young floater woodchucks this time of year, even though you might have success of killing the animals in there, that doesn't mean within a week or two, another animal might move in and reactivate that burrow system. Exclusion is really important. We talked about uh, woodchucks burrowing against hard structures, building foundations, old fences, in, in brush piles, those type of things. 
If you've got buildings, uh, you can use uh, galvanized hardware cloth or heavy galvanized wire of some type, uh, screw it to the base of the building, dig it down into the uh, soil three to four inches below ground level, below ground level, and then you want to make an L-type lift that's about 12 inches out so that the woodchuck can't uh, easily dig under the wire. Uh, this is really good technique, not only for keeping woodchucks out from other build, digging under buildings, but also uh, for keeping rats uh, and mice and other things that might dig in and around the building foundation. We did a woodchuck trial, uh, cabbage trial about 20 years ago at Cornell Agritech. And you can see all those sorry looking cabbages in the front of the photo. Those are about 400 cabbage plants, Kurt Petzl and I had to replant uh, years ago to save this experiment. There was a pair of woodchucks in, uh, in a burrow system right adjacent to the field where we were conducting the trial. And over about a week to 10 day period, those animals consumed all those uh, uh, cabbage plants and we had to replant. Uh, since we had to go through all that effort, we decided to do a pilot test of a very simple fence design. We used electric poly tape. Uh, you can see it stretched across here, three eighths inch fiberglass pole. And on the pole and every five, six feet along the uh, poly tape, we stuck a flag in the ground, put a piece of cloth on it. We put, sprayed those cloth strips uh, with undiluted bobcat urine. Uh, bobcat is a predator of woodchucks and uh, in cat uh, urines are very pungent and persistent and last a long time. And what we found is when we did that trial, we left a hundred cabbages outside, outside the fences controlled. And we had a hundred cabbages adjacent to those inside the fence area and inside the fence, uh, the fence was essentially com uh, completely affected. We didn't have any heart in injury on cabbages inside the fence. For those outside the fence, 94 out of 100 had heart injury. Essentially, the center of the head was gone, and, uh, and that cabbage plant wouldn't produce a full head. And the other uh, plants that they could reach uh, that had some leaf chewing on the outer leaves. So based on that success, we went back the next year and actually did a, a larger replicated study and I uh, wanted to look at uh, the fence with the bobcat urine again, electric fencing alone, rope fence with a bobcat urine, just an unelectrified fence. We wanted to see what the effect of the urine itself was. And then we had control cabbages and we had replicated uh, plots around about a four acre cabbage field at the Agritech uh, station. What we found, in the electric fencing with bobcat urine, we never lost the cabbage. That was 100% effective. The electric fence alone also did extremely well. We only lost a handful of cabbages when we had electric fence alone. What really surprised me uh, was the rope fence with bobcat urine. Uh, we had about 95% protection. We lost about 5% of the cabbages in the rope, the bobcat urine plots. And following this, we shared data with DEC Bureau of Pesticides. We tried to get them to allow us uh, to register urine in, in New York State, bobcat urine, particularly for woodchuck control, and uh, they wouldn't approve it. Uh, they didn't want to get in, involved with a, approving urine. So unfortunately, I can't recommend the rope fence with bobcat urine, uh, but the electric fence alone is probably an excellent way to uh, protect crops and home gardens from, from woodchucks. Let's see. Habitat modification is also really important. Uh, woodchucks rarely are more than uh, 50 to 100 feet from their burrow systems. Uh, so anytime you mow or remove brush or rock cover that exposes woodchucks to natural predators. Uh, unfortunately, it's sort of a double-edged sword removing habitat also removes habitats for a variety of other things like rabbits and songbirds and pheasants, for example. Uh, so uh, you need to consider carefully if you sort of want to use a habitat modification as your primary control technique. Uh, the photo or the drawing on the lower left shows a typical woodchuck burrow system with the main entrance and dirt mound. Usually there are multiple chambers across the burrow system. Secondary entrances, usually there's two, sometimes three secondary entrances. 
Those are dug from the inside out. All the dirt's brought out and uh, deposited at the main entrance. <clears throat> so the secondary entrances can be extremely difficult to find in brush piles and other brushy areas because there's no dirt mound associated with them. Uh, what we found too is if you say pour concrete or plug the main burrow entrance, the woodchucks will just take uh, one of these secondary entrances and reactivate the burrow. So if you try to plug the burrow system, you got to make sure that all the woodchucks are out of it first. Finally, I just want to mention uh, there's a, a fact sheet on woodchucks uh, that we developed several years ago. If you go to my website, wildlifecontrol.info, under the Cornell Pub Publications tab, there's a whole variety of fact sheets on dealing with common urban wildlife problems. And with that, I'm probably about out of time, Matt, so I'll turn it over for questions in uh, John's presentation. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um... Yeah, so we did have a couple of questions come in, but I think the one that I wanted to ask you to talk about was um, regarding what happens after you trap, live trap an animal, because I think there is some confusion about what a homeowner can do if they live capture an animal. Oh, that's a really good point. Under New York State environmental conservation law, if you live capture a vertebrate pest, things like a woodchuck or even a squirrel, <laughs> excuse me, you have two options really on your property. You can humanely euthanize the animal and then uh, uh, bury the carcass on your property, uh, for example, or else the animal can be released alive somewhere on your property. It's illegal for the average landowner to uh, trap a vertebrate pest live and transport it off your property and release it in New York State. The nuisance wildlife control operator's license allows the license wildlife control operator to transport live vertebrate pests, but homeowners cannot do that. So the question is, well, you're going to euthanize it. How do you humanely euthanize it? In rural areas, I found the simplest way for me is uh, just gunshot, a uh, 22 caliber uh, shot uh, to, to the head of the animal. And that's a shooting uh, as a considered humane under American Vet Med Association guidance. Commercial operator often have CO2 gas chamber. And so if they're handling large numbers of animals, they'll euthanize animals that way. That's a very good question. Great, thank you, Paul. And um, so I'll ask John to share his slides now, and then we'll just address the first question that came in. Um, Joellen did provide a link for this, but the question was, um, how do you differentiate between a woodchuck burrow and a rat burrow? Is it based just on size alone? Yeah, it's pretty much on size alone. Uh, a woodchuck burrow is going to have an opening uh, larger than the uh, size of a softball, and a rat burrow is going to have a much smaller opening, more in the line the size of a, a tennis ball or a little bit larger. Excellent. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, we'll transition now to our second speaker. Um, and today, John Hatfield, who is the president, owner, and operator of Wildlife Resolutions, Inc., uh, based in Ithaca, New York. Um, he's been the owner for 10 years and is the current president of the New York State Wildlife Management Association. Um, John will be talking to us today about managing bats in the home. John, take it away. Thank you, Matt. Can you guys see my screen all right? There you go. You're good. So I wanna talk about bats in and around uh, houses and, and your homes. Uh, to start, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what type of bats are in New York. Um, bats inside your house, that's both living space and non-living space. Uh, what to look for while you're, if you're looking for bats, if you're starting to see bats, things to kind of keep your eye out for. We're gonna to touch upon some exclusion if you're gonna to try to tackle it yourself. And then when you should call a professional uh, to help you with resolving bats. So a little bit about bats. Um, in New York state, there are nine species of bats. Two of those bats are known to be in, in, in houses on a regular basis. The big brown bat, is the primary one that we're seeing since white nose syndrome. 
Uh, white nose, if, for those that don't know, is a um, fungal uh, disease that's decimating the little brown bat and the myotis species. Um, and so little brown bats in the past have always been the primary bat that was in houses and big browns were secondary. That has since switched since the introduction of white nose back in 2006. Um, in Ithaca here, and we deal also with northern long-eared bats and eastern small-footed bats that we find intermittently through the migration period in the fall. The eastern pipistrelle and the Indiana bat, those that kind of rounds out the cave dwelling bats, um, do not see them in, in and around houses. And then the other three, we find occasionally, usually they're injured on a sidewalk or uh, came through a door somewhere, but they're not known for houses. Those are tree bats. So bats inside your house, what we find typically when, when bats actually come into the living space tends to be in the late winter into early spring. And then we also find it in the late summer around August into uh, early fall and like September, middle of September. What people don't realize is that in New York here, particularly, uh, bats tend to be in the house year round. They will migrate uh, to cave systems, but some of the bats will actually overwinter here. And so people get surprised in late winter that bats are showing up and they think the migration has started or it's a one-off bat. And typically if you're finding bats in February, you've got a colony of bats somewhere in your house. These pictures over here, these are um, just some things that you're gonna wanna look for. You go up in the attic and there's a cluster of bats up in the, up in the attic space or bat droppings. You know, these, this is bat droppings. Uh, sometimes people think they're mice. So this is a mouse trap. Their droppings look very similar. I uh, unfortunately I don't have a close-up picture other than these two. Um, but it, if you look at it in close quarters, the bat dropping, if you were to pick it up or, or touch it, it'll crumble and fall apart. And if you shine a light on it, it'll illuminate and glisten a little bit. Those are exoskeletons from the insects that they're eating. Bottom picture here, this is what we call sebum. I'll touch on it a little bit later on another slide, but sebum is the oil from the skin. This is staining. This is a big help when you're looking at houses, the outside of your house, where they're coming in. They'll, they'll stain this whole area. One of the things when people start calling, asking about bats in their house, uh, we kept, we, one of the feelers we put out is how many times have you had a bat in your house? Is this the first time you've ever seen one? Is this a regular occurrence? Does it happen, um, you know, every spring, every summer, you know, kind of get a feel for it. The, the rule of thumb is if you have more than three bats in your house in a year, it generally means you have a colony of bats in your house, unless you live in really tight quarters, like in a townhouse or a housing community. Occasionally we find um, an open window where the neighbor actually has bats, but they're coming in intermittently. Uh, places you want to look, unfinished spaces, obviously those are places that aren't cleaned, kept up. That's where you're going to find those clusters of bats in the attic or under insulation. You're also going to find the bat droppings. When you start finding bat droppings, how many, um, how many you have, those all tell you how much, like if, are there bats there? And is there a, an infestation or a problem? Uh, bats on the exterior house don't always have to be a big, um, big problem, but sometimes they're there because it's too hot in the attic, they come out of the house. So you look for how, places where they're coming out to get cooled off. Uh, open windows, a lot of times in August, you get, see people put air conditioners in the window and they don't actually close the, the baffles. That's a, that's a good place on the outside of the house if you start looking around. So just see if there's an open window. I, I, too many times we've been through and seen a window open, they close it and the phone call stops. Like they don't, they're not having a problem anymore. Chimneys, uh, chimneys, soffits, roof lines. Uh, I guess they put top soffits in there twice. 
Um, those are those are key spots that you want to look for. Any dormers uh, where the two roofs come together, that's traditionally where we're going to find bats that are coming into your house. So now that you've looked around and found that there are bats in, in, in your house, you figured out where they're coming in. One of the things when you get into exclusion is that we want to set or hit home with is understand like basic construction and how your house functions before you go and just seal up holes. Um, closing up the gap and crack, that gap might have been there for a reason to let your house breathe or let your house uh, function in a way as it moves. And so sealing up a gap and crack might cause more damage down the road. Um, I cannot stress enough not to just go through and seal up holes without putting what we call one-way doors. Other people call them bat tubes, bat valves. That allows anything that's inside your house to leave. If you seal them up, seal them inside, they're either gonna die inside or they're gonna find their way into the living space. And a couple of times a year we find where we're going out in the middle of the night chasing multiple bats in a house because they seal the hole. So this picture here is a picture of a one-way door that, that we use. It's just a clear plastic tube. Uh, you can find them. They're um, neon light bulb tubes. This is just a little heavier duty, but you can find them at Lowe's or Home Depot. Cut them down. So they fit into a crack nice. The bats can slide out. It has to stay 30 degrees or more. So if, if it's on a 30 degree angle, a bat cannot climb back up this tube. One of the things that we also see quite often are the tubes to let them out made with hardware cloth. Uh, I don't recommend using hardware cloth. It's, it's not good for the, the, the bat itself as far as it rips their wing membranes. And it also creates, creates pr uh, purchase so that they can climb right back up in no matter what the angle is. And then I have done the last point is use high quality material to close up the gaps and cracks. The spray foam is encouraged not to use one. You're going to, uh, you might blow out a soffit because it expands. Uh, it also attracts moisture and causes more issues than, than help. So using a nice adhesive and you want to seal gaps three eighths of an inch or greater. So when do you want to call a professional? Uh, it, for me, it varies. It, if you are really good with construction and comfortable with heights, um, you know, you, you may want to try to tackle the exclusion. But if, if you can't figure out where the bats are coming in or out, you know, you've searched all over, you just can't seem to figure it out, maybe that's when you call a professional. Um, if you can't safely access that area, even if you're comfortable with heights, you, you might want to refer to a, a contractor or a wildlife control company that's gonna be able to safely access that area and exclude those bats from your house. And then uh, the simplest one is if you're anxious and afraid of bats, you're probably not gonna to wanna to climb up into a soffit full of bats and, and try to get them out of the house. So if, if you're anxious, afraid of bats, I would definitely in, encourage you to call a professional. And that's that's kind of the quick and dirty on bats. Uh, these are just some pictures of bats in buildings and uh, kind of the anatomy of a house is if you do hire a professional that this is what they're gonna, some terms that they might be using in places that they find bats. Great, thank you, John. Um, you know, I think you gave us a great overview of some of the things that people can do on their own and then also you know when to call in the professionals and i think you know that's that's often a hard choice for people to make because they don't maybe want to invest the money but knowing that this is inaccessible areas with potential exposure to bats um it's always good to know like what, what's the threshold of of calling a professional yep. so um I want to take the opportunity to thank both uh, paul and john for their great presentations today we did have some questions come in and we will follow up with those and provide them in the description of the YouTube video. Um, our time is at 1230, so we're going to say goodbye for now and hope that you join us for a future First Friday event. Have a great weekend. Thank you.